All right, everybody, we are back with section three of our criminology course, and today we're going to be talking about biological and biosocial theories, okay? Now, starting in kind of the mid to late 19th century, um, this idea of crime as a rational choice was already starting to be seen as um, kind of a, a, a not a very good explanation for crime, and there were two big things going on uh, in the rest of the scientific world that really kind of um, pushed this era of criminal justice theory, okay? One of those was the increased focus on measurement and methods rather than just kind of thinking about things and making claims based on how things kind of sound in your head. Uh, and the second was uh, Darwin and his theory of evolution came out, right? And uh, unfortunately for us, these early biological theorists kind of completely misinterpreted and misused that theory of evolution to try to um, paint certain members of the human population as uh, fundamentally different than other members of the human population based on this theory of evolution being misapplied, okay? Now, this whole um, scientific measurement, uh, we, can, we can do experiments and, and do all kinds of scientific study to determine the truth with a capital T, is called positivism, right? Um, so the first kind of criminal application of this process came about in studies of the human brain, right? And they kind of determined or, or they believed that um, the intelligence of a person and therefore the kind of sophistication and, um, you know, we got to go back to these 19th century ideals of, um, you know, the, the, especially like rich white people, we're inherently better. Um, and thus we must have larger brains and be smarter than the rest of humanity. Right. It's all called craniometry. And this was linked to criminality and a whole bunch of other negative, um, kind of social factors, including being poor and being stupid and all these other things. This was pretty quickly uh, rejected because the early craniometry supporters, after they passed away, uh, it was found that their brain sizes were actually smaller than average in a lot of cases. So this morphed into phrenology. And phrenology was less about brain size and more about brain shape, right? So it wasn't necessarily how big your brain was. It was, you know, whether there were bumps here or there in this part of the brain or in that part of the brain, or if you had lots of, um, you know, if you had a, a larger occipital lobe versus temporal lobe versus parietal lobes and all those things. One of the benefits here was you could, they thought you could get a measure of this prior to death, right? The only way you can measure brain size is after somebody dies. But you can measure brain shape, it was thought, by feeling on the skull and measuring where the bumps are in the skull and how large those bumps are and everything. Uh, but again, this was relatively quickly rejected, um, if for no other reason than they found that, um, you know, the bumps on your skull do not necessarily correspond to the bumps on your brain. So this migrated into physiognomy which is where they measured lots of different body parts, not just the brain. Everything from the width of the nose to the distance between the pupils of the eye to the angle of, you know, the mouth and all these other things. Uh, height, weight, musculature, all kinds of different measurements, right? This really inspired this dude named Lombroso. And he published a book in 1876 called The Criminal Man. I've actually got a copy of this book in my office and it is wild, okay? <clears throat> but this guy, um, I believe he was, uh, like Beccaria, he was Italian. 
again, don't quote me on that. Some some European country, I think Italy. He did a big study on um, prisoners in his country and soldiers in his country. And he used this physiognomy uh, to try to kind of measure all these different factors uh, of people's bodies and try to distinguish between the prisoners who are obviously criminals and bad people and soldiers who are obviously, you know, the best of us and we all love soldiers and everything. <clears throat> And he found very significant differences, right? Now, what he believed was that this showed that criminals and other kind of delinquent, you know, social rejects are an evolutionary atavism, which is kind of a, a again, based on a misreading, misunderstanding of how evolution works. But this, we're, this term atavism kind of means like an evolutionary throwback, right? These, these prisoners are clearly less evolved than the rest of us. <clears throat> and you can measure this and you can kind of, um, you can determine how much of an atavist a person is based on their stigmata, which is the individual kind of <coughs> physical signs that somebody is less evolved or atavistic than others, right? Um, and this could be based on their, you know, height and, and weight and um, their everything from skin pigment to uh, brain size, you know, the temple to temple distance and all these other things. One of my favorite kind of ridiculous aspects of this uh, is that he believed that tattoos were one example of stigmata that indicated this evolutionary atavism. Which is completely ridiculous for a lot of reasons, but the most obvious is that tattoos aren't inherited. They're not biological. <clears throat> Clearly, right? <clears throat> and then again, in a misapplication of this kind of new field of evolutionary theory, Lombroso said that he, he tried to explain the difference in criminality between men and women by saying that these stigmata meant that the criminalistic, atavistic members of our species were less physically attractive. And because men only wanted to mate with physically attractive women, these atavisms, these stigmata, were slowly bred out of the female half of the species, whereas they still remained in the male half of the species. Again, ridiculous, but unfortunately, again, for us, incredibly influential on criminal justice for the next 50, 60, 70 years, okay? So, then along came an English guy <clears throat> who also studied prisoners and compared them to non-prisoners, but this time, instead of soldiers, he did soldiers and professors and students and, you know, kind of a bunch of other groups that are seen as more socially acceptable, socially um, positive, compared to these, again, what he saw as rejects uh, in prison. Now, this was in general, viewed as an attack on Lombroso, pointing out how Lombroso was wrong about which stigmata he identified as being evidence of this atavism and blah, blah, blah. But he came to the same basic conclusion, that there were, was this biological deterministic nature of criminality, and there are some people who are just biologically inferior, uh, unlike him and people like him who are clearly biologically superior, but the only real physical signs that you could tell, according to this guy, were that prisoners were shorter, thinner, and of lower intelligence. And now keep in mind that uh, this <clears throat> lower intelligence was not based on any kind of measurement of intelligence. This was just kind of his personal opinion that he claims to have seen clear evidence of, but, you know, there was no formal or in any way kind of scientific measurement of this level of intelligence, right? So then we get to the United States and this guy Hooten. And in 39, he 
wrote a book called Crime and the Man, which, where he attacked Goring, but again came to the same basic conclusions as both Lombroso and Goring did. Um, he did a big study of 17,000 Americans, uh, again, prisoners versus assorted civilian populations, including, you know, uh, professors, students, soldiers, firefighters, police, etc., etc., etc. And again, his overall conclusion was that Lombroso and Goring were both wrong, <clears throat> but it is still very clear that crime is not due to social factors, it's not due to environmental factors, it is due to the fact that criminals are organically inferior. The kind of the, the final big theorist when it comes to these early uh, biological theories was this guy Sheldon, who came up with the idea of somatyping. And this is where you can kind of tell what kind of person somebody is uh, based on which one of three groups their body type fits into. And he claimed that there were three different kinds of body types. The endomorph, the mesomorph, and the ectomorph. Okay, So all of humanity, every person uh, in our species falls into one of these three categories. And you can tell which category they're in based on their body shape. And which category they're in determines everything from personality to criminality to IQ to all kinds of other things. Right? <clears throat> so the endomorph... The, I'm slightly simplifying this, obviously. Uh, I, I don't have a, enough time to go into all the details and all the kind of distinguishing characteristics of this. But in essence, the endomorphs were kind of chunkier, you know, what, what modern people would might call a dad bod. The mesomorphs were the muscular ones, the big, tough, strong kind of people. And then the ectomorphs were skinny, slight, frail, right? And according to Sheldon, it was clearly the mesomorphs, those muscular ones, that committed most of the crime, right? Now, the big problem with Sheldon's theory is that there was very, very little intra-observer reliability. In other words, Sheldon would train people on how to identify which of these three uh, body types somebody fit into. And then researchers would sit those people down and give them a stack of photos of different people. And they would have to categorize that stack of photos into one of these three categories. And whereas one person might categorize a person as an endomorph, another person might categorize that same person as a mesomorph or, you know, uh, something along those lines. So even if Sheldon personally trained these different people who are supposed to then be experts on categorizing any given individual into one of these three categories... It was never really clear, it was never really well um, kind of understood exactly which category people should be in. There was huge amounts of disagreement among those different uh, raters as to which category any given individual might fall into, right? Now, kind of around the same time, <clears throat> um, there was also... Uh, there was the, the, the idea of IQ, right? The intelligence quotient. How smart are people? We can have uh, a direct measure of how intelligent somebody is. We don't have to do like Goring did and just kind of give our word for it. You know, you, oh, clearly this person's stupider or that person's smarter or whatever. We need a way to objectively measure intelligence, right? <clears throat> so... Back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, this guy Binet created this IQ test. And his idea was, um, you take a child at a certain age, you give them a test, and if they score exactly the, you know, they score the same as other children of their age, or what we would expect a child of that age to score, that is a 100, right? Average for that age. But if somebody scores, somebody gets, if a child gets a score on the IQ test that we would expect from somebody older than them, 
They would get higher than a 100 score. If they score on the IQ test, what would we would expect of a child younger than them, they get a score under 100, right? So if you're 10 years old and you take an IQ test and you get a score of exactly what we would expect from a 10-year-old, you get a 100 IQ. But if you're a 10-year-old and you score what we would expect a 12-year-old to score, you have a much higher than 100 IQ. But if you're 10 and you take the test and you score what we would expect a 7 or 8 or 9-year-old to score, your IQ is then lower than 100, right? <clears throat> and part of Binet's mission in creating this IQ test was to identify who needs more help. Because we can increase the IQ of students who need it, right? If, if students come through and they take this test and they're found to have under, an I, under a 100 IQ, those are the ones we need to give more attention to. They're the ones we need to kind of help out a little bit more in school, give them more resources, more time, more attention, in order to bring them back up to that 100 level, which is where we kind of expect them to be, hopefully before they finish their education. <clears throat> But this other guy, Goddard, for some reason, he decided that IQ isn't changeable. It's, it's, we can't give them more attention. This IQ is innate. It's biological. You are born and, and, and your physical, biological body determines your IQ. <clears throat> and thus, uh, there's no point in spending time and energy on those children who score under 100 we should ignore them. We should be focused on the ones that score above 100 because those are clearly the smart ones, the ones who are going to end up in better positions as adults. <clears throat> um, we don't need to waste our time on the stupid ones, right? That was his idea. And one of the things he did to kind of show that there were some people that were better than others um, in the United States, he tested a whole bunch of immigrants, right? So all these new immigrants are moving to the United States. Um, they would be given IQ tests when they first arrived. And sure enough, most of these immigrants uh, were found to be, have much lower than 100 IQs, right? And they used that to justify this kind of anti-immigrant, racist... Like, we don't want these stupid people to come into our country. That's going to make us worse as a country. We only want the smart people to come in. Um, but kind of what they neglected to figure out was that, of course, these immigrants tested lower on the IQ scores. If nothing else, the IQ tests were written in English. And a lot of these immigrants either spoke English as a second or third language or really not at all. So, of course, they scored worse, right? <clears throat> And the IQ test was written to gauge the intelligence of American children. There were questions on there that would be very common knowledge for American children, but that immigrants from other countries might have never learned because they had completely different living experiences in their, in their home country, right? So it was used in this kind of racist, isolationist message when in reality, it was just a terrible way to try to gauge the intelligence of people that the test wasn't designed to measure the intelligence of. Now, based on the scores of these IQ tests, uh, Goddard and others kind of created these labels for people with lower than 100 IQ. And there was kind of a ranking. So if it was, you know, below 70 you were at one level, and then 70 to 80, you were another, and then 80 to 100, you were another. And these levels were named things that we now recognize as just kind of silly schoolyard insults, right? So, moron, imbecile, idiot. While today we just see these as kind of juvenile insults, back then they were medical diagnoses based on the score a person got on one of these early IQ tests. <clears throat> so when somebody calls you a moron, that is them technically diagnosing you as having scored below some certain number on an IQ test, right? Now, 
all of these kind of biological theories from IQ testing to Lombroso stigmata to, uh, you know, the, all this other stuff <clears throat> was a big part of the eugenics movement, which is hugely popular in the early 20th century, especially in the United States, right? And the eugenics movement was once again kind of that evil, really, really immoral application of this misunderstanding of evolutionary theory. And eugenics basically said, we only want the best people to breed and have children. We want all the worst members of society to be cut off from breeding and to not have children. And that way we will improve our species uh, over the long term with many succeeding generations. Right? It's kind of, you know, when you think of breeding dogs to increase or decrease the... Uh, appearance of some trait it's the same kind of thing but with humans <clears throat> so according to this eugenics movement one of the best ways to ensure that kind of the human species improved over time and only the best people reproduced and the worst people didn't reproduce was with sterilization whether voluntary or more commonly involuntary sterilization in other words, if somebody was judged to be deficient, they could be forced to undergo some kind of surgical procedure or other uh, intervention that permanently made it impossible for those people to have children. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called Buck v. Bell in 1927, and the Supreme Court said, no, that is perfectly acceptable. They bought into this whole biological determinism nonsense, um, which, again, was really, really kind of racist and sexist and, and um, classist. But the Supreme Court bought into it all because it was the dominant theory in the United States in the early 20th century. And they said this involuntary sterilization is perfectly acceptable if somebody has been judged by these experts to be uh, a lower quality human then it is perfectly within the bounds of the Constitution to involuntarily sterilize them. The most depressing part of this, at least to me, is that this case, Buck v. Bell, has never been overturned. It is still, theoretically, Supreme Court precedent that involuntary sterilization is perfectly acceptable uh, as a, a, a method of improving the human species. Now, the good news is that's not really so much of an issue anymore. This is not a matter of policy in any significant way in the United States anymore. The bad news is it was as recently as the 1970s. As recently as the 1970s, people were still undergoing involuntary sterilization because they were deemed to be lesser or problematic. And thus, we didn't want them breeding. We didn't want them spreading their defective genetics onto the next generation. <clears throat> now, the good news is, by the 1950s, this entire idea started losing power. It started losing influence on, uh, in the field of criminal justice, right? We kind of figured out, wow, that's, you know, all this biological theories, you know, this Lombroso stuff and, the, you know, um, the idea that we can determine somebody's criminality merely by measuring certain parts of their body. Uh, that's just nonsense. And they figured out it was, it was just, it was very racist. It was very sexist. It was very classist, right? It completely ignored all of the social factors that go into whether somebody becomes a criminal clearly, you know, everything from education to social class to living conditions to all kinds of other things that clearly have some kind of effect, whether direct or indirect, on whether somebody becomes a criminal or not. But up until this point, in the first half of the 20th century, there were who knows how many criminals who went to trial and were convicted based primarily or even solely on their body. 
the distance between their pupils and whether they had tattoos and whether they had scars and their hair color and, you know, all these other just completely inconsequential factors of their physical selves were used by juries in who knows how many cases to find somebody guilty because clearly they were biologically inferior and a born criminal. And even if they didn't commit this crime, clearly they had committed other crimes or would commit other crimes in the future. So we needed to lock them up. It was a very, very, very dark chapter in American history, in American criminal justice history specifically. <clears throat> and this idea of biology as deterministic in whether somebody becomes a criminal or not is kind of completely out the window. But, as we'll see in the next subsection, there is still an interaction between biology and crime. There is still a lot of study and a lot of science being done on the interaction between different types of biological uh, factor within the human body and whether that correlates with crime or not. But we're going to talk about that in the next subsection. I appreciate you watching.